Welcome to the Collingwood Rant. We are recording after the loss to Brisbane. We're recording quite a few days after the loss to Brisbane. I'm Sly. And I'm... It's just another point, Spook. Spook, any memories to any other game we might have lost in the last minute or so? <laughs> yeah, no, it was a stern reminder, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of this game, I was actually at a function, so... I was on... So you say you were pissed? Yeah. Yep. Like the players. Um... So I was only peripherally paying attention to it in the first half or so, and I was watching... So you were really pissed? Yeah. And then I was watching a little bit more closely in the second half. But you've fallen over. Yeah, from the floor. It's just... Uh, the thing that didn't strike me, because it's Groundhog Day, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, is it's just emblematic of every single Collingwood effort nowadays. The endeavours there, they try. Defensively, they're terrible... <laughs> Uh, tackling doesn't seem to stick or be really destructive. Uh, a lot of skill errors and decision-making careers where you just go, okay, well, why would you make that choice? And then you get a lot of that stagnant movement highlighted by the occasional flash of brilliance, and then it's just back to like, oh, okay, we're just trying to find a way to move the ball forward. Oh, I thought you were about to say find a way to lose. No, well, no, we know how to lose. We don't need to find a way. I've researched this, um, and I can only think of the West Coast final, but have we actually won a close one since losing the 2018? Yeah, we beat West the, Coast by a point. Yeah, that's the one I... No, no, the final, we beat them in 2019 okay. by a point also. Were, were we trailing, or did we just hold on? We, we trailed for the first half, and then we dominated the second half on a wasteful in front of the goal. Shocking as that may seem. Oh, it's, it sounds unusual. And we ended up winning by a point. We probably should have won about three, four goals. Um, but I'm sure we, you know, we bet Essendon and Anzac Day 219 by under a, you're just full of shit, really. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering whether there was any lingering, uh, um, doubt over that, uh, grand final. Um, but, uh, clearly I got it wrong. So we can move on. You can, you can edit that out if you want. I don't think anyone's interested. No. Look at the team. And I want to make this point because this is going to be a big theme of what we discussed. And I mean, I, think anyone, team. Yeah. I don't think it's going to change all that much over the next eight yeah, And that's what we're going to talk about. Oh, good. So, looking at the team we fielded, I broke it down into three groups. Producers, now these are the good players who make something happen. Like movies. Yep. And they're the ones that get things started or contribute. And there's 16 of those. I'm not going to name them. I'll, go, I'll get back to them in a bit. And then you have another group of players who I'll call for the moment, burdens. And you have six of those. And in that burden group, you have the two Browns, Hoskin Elliott, Magadan, Braden Sire, and Josh Thomas. And that's not to say they might not be good players, like the two Browns might become good players. But right now, those six aren't doing enough. Is there every chance they're going to be in the next group as well? No, no, no. But it, oh, I'm going to get to the next group in a minute. But pretty much every week, those six aren't going to contribute meaningfully to possessions or to goals or anything like that. Or anything, really. But, you know, as I said, I mean, they might improve. Braden Sire might rediscover his 218 form. I mean, he's had flashes of um, promising form. I mean, Josh Thomas had one good first quarter. So, I mean, you know, you don't play 32 bad games in a row. Hoskin Elliott's really struggled. Magden, he seems to have, like, taken a backward step from last year. He looked pretty reliable. So, of the 22 and, you know, the 18 on field, you might have six of these guys who you're really just carrying. And then of the producers, you have seven who are problematic. And of that seven, I'm going to name them. Jack Crisp, Braden Maynard this year, John Noble, Ruffett, although he was good, Cox, Main, and Dugowie. And they're the guys, they may do nothing. They could have one great game one week, they'll have an average game the next week. What do you mean, may? Yeah, okay, well, there you go. Uh, you know, Crisp is a really good example. It was great against Carlton, didn't really do much against Brisbane. So of the 22 players, you have potentially 13 players who are not going to contribute meaningfully to your side's performance against the opposition. And that's just way, way too much. And that puts a lot of pressure on guys like Adams and um, Pendles and Sidey and all that. And those guys could have bad games too. So you have a huge contingent of that side who just doesn't do enough. Mm. And that's been going on, I think, for two years. You know, 218, they were all pretty much firing. They had that one-out, one one-out, one-in policy. They really all contributed in some way. Those guys like Oscar Nelly and Thomas, they did well up forward. So a lot of, lot's changed since then. If you look at the side now, you should surely be saying, and we've been saying it for a while, look, it's time to get some young blood in there. Do you think? You think? Oh, no, not usually. If I did, I wouldn't be following this team. <laughs> 
No, I um, entirely agree. I mean, it, it, this is that thing I think we talked about leading up to, to the um, season proper, is at some point you're either going to make that decision or that decision is going to be thrust upon you that the balance of, uh, of what you deem to be the same side we see week in, week out has to give way to, to more than one kid coming through. It's going to have to be almost multiples just to get games into them. And and that you, you, it's going to be sad to probably see that happen when the season blows out, assuming it blows out, um, where you're going to just be forced to do that. Um, I don't know what we're covering here, but again, you know, it just feels too much at the moment that we're we've got a club that's focused. Well, it's a side that's focusing on on the Buckley's yeah. um, career more than the betterment of the side. So some of these decisions and selections being made are at the detriment of, of development to try and win games to, to to keep a particular job, which makes no sense to me. I mean, I think not after ten years. I think the way the list is structured. You, you still need to keep some senior players in there. Oh, yeah, that's definitely, yeah. And you need to keep a framework to keep it relatively balanced. Otherwise, they're not going to learn. I mean, I do worry about... Well, not really worry, but like I do think about Jaden Stevenson at North, if they're losing by 10 goals every week, is that really great development for any of their young players? But So you need to sort of keep a framework and remain competitive. But the ones that I really question are... Hoskin Elliott. Yep. Josh Thomas. Yep. Callum Brown. Yep. Now, uh, Callum Brown's sort of getting up there around 50 games also, so he's he's not experienced, but he's been around a little while. We've talked about how we feel, we, you know, we actually think he's a promising player, but he probably should have been dropped two years ago. Couldn't really do it last year because of the way the season was, but surely when you're producing like 10 possession games like Hoskin Elliott and um, Thomas are regularly doing, and, and Callum Brown's not that much further behind him, bringing in a Finley McRae or a Nathan Murphy or whoever the case might be, Oliver Henry... You're not going to get much less from them, but the investment promises a bigger return potentially in the future. Yep. Totally and the right. other thing too, the, the flip side of that too is, you know, if I just drop Thomas to just, and Hoskin Elliott, just to fucking tell him your positions aren't sacrosanct, you know? You're not playing well, you're going down. You need to earn your way back up. I think there's too many players who just almost have a sense of entitlement and we're not going to get dropped. We're part of the core team. And that I'm of- first pick, coach. Well, I can't imagine that's good for the morale because there's rumours now that there's ructions around the, along the playing group about who's being selected and who's not. Maine was a massive... I shouldn't say a massive surprise. It wasn't a surprise at all, but like for, for people who are sort of on the outside looking in going, well, would you really bring him back at 30, 31? I, mean, I know he's going to be competitive. He offers his experience body. He offers a concussion every week. But do you really feel he should be the one who's going to take Elliot's spot? Shouldn't that be like no. Bo McCreary or, you know, even bringing someone who could display someone like a John Noble up forward for a little bit or something like that? Maine does, Maine's not a like for life for Elliot. But the, uh, you saw um, McCreary was the injury sub, sub yeah. and the club tugged themselves over a debut, the debut of a bloke who jogged up and down the, the boundary line at the end of the game. And yeah, you know, when when Maine went down, how many times did he go down during this game? About forty two. Yeah, but he had like one prolonged period on the bench. Yeah, well, and that's at the point where it looked like they were going to make that that sub change, and they didn't. Anything, oh, it just doesn't make sense that you, this is meant to be. You know, the big focus is on 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 head injuries now. And you had a bloke who's arguing essentially with a medical guy that I'm okay because because that's always worked with players in the past. They overrule the uh, the the people who actually qualified. Um, and he, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, we're talking about the Collingwood Medical <laughs> Department, okay? And I was being facetious with that statement, but in this case, he, it almost appeared like he did. And he sat how long on the, on the bench oh, for? about 20 minutes or something. Yeah, yeah, well, no, I think he had time to watch um, the Irishman. I mean, he couldn't even get his head collected in the last minute um, properly without I mean, but he's, getting he's, he's, The reason he wasn't in the senior side was because he was concussed. I think he got hit in the head um, in the pre-season, shower. yeah. But now preseason, he got hit in the head by the ball or something, and he was concussed, and that's why he you wasn't. Think that, in that springy head would have absorbed any impact. But it's like okay, so he's coming back from a concussion, and he gets concussed again. Surely you should be saying, "Well, let's be really cautious now." I mean, I, I, I and now you're going to sort of buckle. So you look at. Buckles. I'm just going to intervene for a second here and just give my early um, prediction for, for for the change this week, and that he'll be admitted main for that head injury, it'll have a delayed effect and they won't, um, they'll be cautious now because the game's well and truly gone. They'll bring in Greenwood 
and um, we'll probably introduce some other new player as the uh, injury sub and then spend three days on social I media. actually heard Buckles is bringing in Sam Dyer and Josh Smith. Ooh, now we're talking. No, so look at the... Look at the but bu- yeah, look, you know, you, yeah, look. Where, the, where they should have done the right thing with Maine, they'll, they'll do the right thing now five days after the loss. Well, that'll help. I mean, Brisbane had a interrupted preparation because of the COVID situation and all that. They looked a classy aside. We have just too many players who really are plotters now. It, it's very reminiscent of that 04 05 period uh, after the grand. I mean, the 2002 03 grand final size, they were very workmanlike. But then 04 05, we had injuries, and injuries were like the players like Buckley and that. So we're relying on all these plotters to sort of try and carry the team's fortunes. And they had, you know, they put in great efforts and all that, but they didn't have the class and all that to really be competitive over the whole season. And you look at the side now, it's just the same thing. It's like, I don't... There's, Hoskin Elliott has skill, but the way he's performing, he looks like just a, you know, he looks like an average... He should be teaching camouflage to um, the SAS. Well, what did you That's mean? the sort of skill he's got. Well, so David King highlight, highlighted his lack of accountability at the end. What, his King's lack of accountability? What did he do wrong? He didn't highlight Buckles' lack of accountability. No, no, with... Um, on the counter attack, when Brisbane, when Rich got the ball, side bottom and Pendles ran to zone. Uh, there was a number of players like Josh Dacos and Hoskin Elliott. Although Dacos remonstrated with Hoskin Elliott, so I don't know if Dacos didn't know where to go because Hoskin Elliott wasn't in position. Taylor Adams also, but they didn't zone up to block Brisbane mm-hmm. going through the centre. So Hoskin Elliott was never really known as a defensive type of forward in terms of you know applying a lot of tackles and all that sort of stuff he's always known for his you know he's got some freakishness about him but what do you think about that you know on the counter attack the game's in the balance and players aren't running back to zone there's a couple of things with this I mean you really at this point because it's easy when you come off a terrible loss like that that you want to point the finger of blame at something um, in this instance surely You've got coaches here that, that train and prepare you for these these moments when you have to defend that type of situation and what to do. And leaving a wide open corridor in the middle, it's pretty damning. Well, I know during- and that, does the onus fall back on those guys for misreading it? Well, surely they should just do this by second nature and, and position themselves to, to stop that ball from coming through. Well, I know when Hawthorne was on their free peat that that was a big thing at Clarkson's training. He trained... They used to run match simulations like... It's the last couple of minutes of the game and it's mm. close. So it became ingrained in them how to respond. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it probably shows the massive disconnect between coaching staff and players. So either the coaching staff has missed it, which is a failure of their duty. Either they've failed to communicate it, which is a failure of their duty. The players have failed to carry it out, which is a failure of their duty. Or the players aren't aware enough to read the situation and know what to do, again, which is a failure of their duty. It, it, it's like King pointed out in that um, video, that you know, they're running in a, in a method that looks like they want to get the ball and score again. At this point of the game, you're saving the game. We were, what, 11 um, points up with two minutes to go. Yeah. This is a time where you sit there and you start chipping the ball around and, and winding the clock down. You wouldn't be taking the game on at that point, surely. Well, not unless it was wide open or you were pretty confident of what you could do. But again, that you know the way we play, we turn to tend to turn the ball over. I mean, people bag Carlton quite frequently, and, and good on um, for just they've forgotten how to win some of those close games, and Carlton's just proved it time and time again. And I'd hate to see us become that side. I mean, where... In fairness to Carlton, they again are having a horrid injury run, which is they've had it for about five years. You know, they've been losing players left and right, so. They're, they're fielding sides with a lot of not quite mm. right players. So are we. What do you think of Grundy's performance? He sort of responded to critics? Oh, you were not sort of. He did respond to critics. Oh, I mean, really? So he should have. I mean, who was he rucking against? Well, I think it was two guys in the crowd at one stage. Um, but he dominated. And he should in that thing. And you can't fault him for that. You well, know, the- when, when it's stacked in your favour, um, you should rise to that and not be lax and, and just go out there and and piss fart around. So I actually thought his performance was quite encouraging. Well, the club went into PR mode last week before the game because they posted... What, what it. stat did they invent this week? Oh, that was Grundy's hits to advantage. He had more hits to advantage than anyone yeah, else. Um, was not uh, Bucks come out and say something about um, he doesn't rate hit-out stats or something or oh, meaningless or something? But 
that Grundy was like three ahead of his next two, which were Natanui and Jesus, I just forgot uh, the other Max one. Gorn. Yeah, Max Gorn. But he actually had like about twenty five more taps than them. And then he was on like five or six ahead of Mark Pitternet, I think it was. Who? But the Carlton Ruckman. Ah. But he was like forty taps in front of him. So the ratio of how many taps he's getting to advantage to you know, compared to how many taps is just really pretty low. So what was the hit out stats though in this game? It was like ninety to six yeah. or something yeah. absurd. So, so he actually translated that on Thursday night, but again, you know, th- that whole synergy between the midfield and the Ruckman just doesn't work with Collingwood. It hasn't worked for three years. What during a Moore's game, Joe Dan Hur Yeah, he, it was I don't think it was a great matchup. And this is this is why I don't think Moore should be playing fullback. It's like, okay, what a waste. What a waste. <laughs> you have got a dominant forward in Danaher who's just running rampant and he's totally disrupting your entire defensive efforts and he's making a mockery of this star defender you've got. You're throwing the opposition in such disarray. More, in my opinion, could be doing that for us, but instead we got him intercepting. Um, anyway, so Buckles, is he coaching, you feel, for his contract? For, oh, definitely. Surely he should know after nine years that even if he had like a full list, let's say he didn't get rid of Stevenson, or not him, but the club didn't get rid of Stevenson and Phillips and Trelaw, and they were still like a, you know, a, a contender in name. Surely he'd know that even if he finished fifth or sixth, they weren't going to renew him. No, it, it's it's folly. I mean, surely this this should have been explained to him. Like, you know, Tony Shaw's last season, which which was pretty much, well, this is what you're doing. You've 10 years in this job. You're, you're very unlikely to be renewed at the end of the year. Surely these discussions already happened that you just... They didn't... I mean, th- th- this is Collingwood, though. You wouldn't have gone into this season thinking, oh, we're a flag chance. Oh, they might have. Because, I mean, that side we got, the, we filled that side. That's it. That's pretty much it. There's not much depth under there. There's no depth. I mean, Elliot's out for the season now for broken So, so you, you're putting all your eggs into the fact that we won't ever get injured again this year. <laughs> and that these blokes are going to play above themselves week in, week out. And we just happily have these other guys run around the VFL chasing each other. It, it was never going to happen that way. And I don't think we're ever going to be that competitive to, to get near the top four this year. So well, surely there's got to be an approach that you take about how you play some of these kids each week and you hope that you sort of throw your snare some wins. But they're going in full tilt at the moment to think, well, wins are wins are wins. And what are we, one and three? It's not working well as a strategy. So at some point it has to switch the other way that you're going to have to then bring a couple more in. Whether they do it this week, I mean, Jesus, GWS, is there anything left of that side? They're fielding their under I think games. you and I could probably beat them by at least 300 goals. Okay, one thing that's annoying me is the three players who are left have gone. They're apparently the worst footballers to have ever stepped foot on the park now. I mean, if those three were at Collingwood, would they be in the starting 18? Absolutely. We would on by six goals if they played the other night. So we missed next player watch last week because we recorded before they played their game. Well, games. that was lucky, because they were all pretty shit. So round two, Suns defeated North by 59 points. Stevenson got 14 disposal, eight kicks, six handballs, 64% disposal efficiency. Tigers defeated the Hawks by 29 points. Phillips got 15 kicks, nine handballs, but only had 46 disposal percent disposal efficiency. Bulldogs defeated the Eagles by seven points over there, which is a great win. Truller had 11 kicks, 14 handballs, three marks, two tackles, and had 80% disposal efficiency. Well, actually, he was pretty good then. Yeah. So... Last week, or well, this round three, so we're one and two, not one and three. Round three, Bulldogs defeated North by a lazy 128 points. Trelaw, 16 kicks, 11 handballs, three marks, two tackles. He kicked three goals, one. He had 67% disposal efficiency, which is probably just a little bit low, but geez, he kicked three goals, so who gives a fuck? You take that. Yep. Um, Stevenson had 15 kicks, four handballs in a 128 point loss. He. Kicked two out of North Melbourne's five goals, and he had sixty-three percent disposal efficiency in in a loss that big. I'm not surprised about the disposal efficiency being down. Geelong defeated Hawthorne by five points. Phillips twelve kicks, nine handballs, three tackles, five marks, eighty-six percent disposal efficiency. So he's back up. So with the three games that they've played, you know, and they were totally vandalised by fans, Collingwood fans, saying, "Oh, their disposal's terrible," and all this. So in three of the games they've played. In two of the games, the disposal has been fine. Trelaws has been fine the whole year. Um, how anyone can sort of walk around going, I'm glad we got rid of him, or we can cover him, or we didn't have room for him, or any of that shit, and who aren't looking at that list that goes out every week or that team that goes out every week and doesn't believe 
that those three players wouldn't immediately improve us by three, four goals. It's beyond me. Mm. I think it's more an indictment on, again, the coaching strategies and how those players were employed and what their output was compared to, say, 2018 when they actually had a system. Mm. Let me ask him about Buckles. Mark, Mark, Robert Harvey and um, Brendan Sanderson, assistant coaches. Is that, is that a statement meant to come as a surprise? It's been that way no. for 40 years. Yeah. Are you surprised that we're not producing anything new this year? By, by proxy, they're coaching for their jobs as well. If the main coach goes, those two are gone. So you look at um, Sydney... They wanted to revitalise their on-field strategies. They brought in Don Pike, who used to be coach of Adelaide, and Adelaide made a grand final four years ago, and they were really good. And Pike was more of an offensive coach, and they found a way to inter- integrate his attack into Sydney's naturally dour defensive strategies. And now they're scoring freely. They play this free-flowing game. They move the ball really well. John Longmire had the... Courage. He's mm-hmm. been coaching since what about nineteen sixty one. For I mean, he's been coaching for pretty much as long as Buckles. He doesn't qualify in our uh, hate speech though because he won a flag. No, no. But I'm saying he's been coaching for a while and he Rebended looked. Himself, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he looked and said, "We need to do something different. We need to." And they've got kids coming through. Uh, granted, their kids are a high caliber than ours because they have academy access to a lot of guns and all that sort of stuff. But they've actually changed the way they've played. Buckles and staff sort of said, you know, we're going to change the way we've played. But you really just see the same stuff. You see that spasmodic output with no consistency in the way they move the ball, a lot of defensive, a um, lot, lot of lack of a skill error, a lot of skill errors, a lot of lack of defensiveness and all that sort of stuff. So they're just doing the same shit. If you were to suggest to Buckles, hey, we'll keep you on, what would he have to do? I think we covered this about 12 times and it'd have to be with a flag. No, no. But or you're talking... No, even if you didn't win a flag and you said, we're going to keep you on regardless, what would you have to do? You'd have to seriously look at the way that we have a game plan and, and completely throw that out the window and start from you. But surely what they should be doing... I mean, it's not going to happen because I don't think they're going to keep him on. But surely it should be just like... And I think they should have done this last year. Look... Robin, I've been a great servant of the club. Thank you for your service. Off you oh, go. Yeah. Are you talking like we should have done leading in or are you talking what we should do now? I'm just saying if he was to be kept on without the results, with you know... It, next it, year. Yeah, next year. What would he have to oh, do? Oh, yeah, definitely you'd move them on. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, look, I, I haven't been anything but an advocate of, of, of throwing out the bulk of Collingwood and starting from scratch. So you think it's emblematic of what's wrong with the club that they went into this season, three players down in their starting 18... Nothing coming up, and there really isn't nothing coming up because last year COVID affected the, the lower tier competition, so they didn't have exciting talent coming up. They didn't have a Jaden Stevenson coming into the side as a high pick um, who could, you know, was plug and play. Why did this club actually think, oh, we can go one better than last year? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know. Uh, that's what I said before. I just don't understand the, the strategy around what we're doing at the moment. It's, it's, it's what you've got there isn't going to win a flag. Does it really? You, you've cut, uh, th- no, not third, but you cut three players out of that that actually made that task harder and you're not bringing anything new because you've, you've gone out and you've drafted 64 kids that you don't seem to be interested in playing for very long. Well, you, you, drop, you cut three players and then you lose guys like Reed and Varco and all that. So you've lost actually, I mean, Reed wasn't really in, but Varco was sort of in and out. You've lost like one sixth of your on field playing personnel, and you haven't really had a um, a rollover in terms of personnel with players who are ready to come and replace them. And no, that's it, because it, you it haven't is. played them last year, also. Which you know, it's not entirely the fault of the club. Obviously, there it wasn't is. much of a of a feeder comp. And on that, when's the VFL starting? Was it in December this year? Seventeenth April or something like that. It's on month later. I think if they're trying to accommodate the AFLW. Um, but last year they had the option because again this goes back to this is one thing like when I say play kids a bit ah oh, you know that's just the feeder status and shit it's like well hang on Josh Thomas is getting like four possessions he kicked three goals last year or whatever it was some kid in the wings could do that yes that's right so you have players there who are not producing Callum Brown's another one like I said I like Callum Brown but he's really struggled he's got shot though oh jeez yeah um, he's really struggled surely 
you could have dropped him last year and brought in Jay Rantel or Bianco, and you weren't going to get much less from them. You would have given them some exposure. They might have hit the ground running. I mean, there's times you do get young players who look okay in the VFL, yeah, and, and then, then you bring yeah. them up, and it's like, bang. They just they really respond to the better system, and they thrive off the pressure and all that. And we only gave one well, one and a half guys to look in last season, which is Trey Risco and then Will Kelly. Um, and it's like, again, you had underperforming players in there. Why aren't you giving them more of a chance? Why aren't you giving, sorry, uh, the players under them more of a chance? Yeah, totally agree. Uh, rumours on Petrarca coming to Collingwood? <laughs> Why not? And, um, and yeah, no. I, I, I'm, I told you this one in November too. Yeah, I heard it. yeah, no, I can't see how they could actually make that happen. You'd have to give up something. What he's he's a restricted free agent. No, not for another year. All right, so you're trading for him. Um, we have how many first round picks? Oh, no. Uh, we have how many good quality players would be happy to give up? Oh, you only have like Darcy Moore and Dugowie, really, who I, I I think are going to net like for like top of that type of trade. But it, I, I mean, if Collingwood were to you know want to pile an Arsenal, so they trade Darcy Moore for maybe a pick 25, 26, and Dugowie to get like a pick thirty, thirty one at Collingwood because <laughs> we're a student that yeah, matter. yeah. So I don't know if pick thirty on the pick twenty, it's twenty six bundled together would satisfy Melvin yeah, for no, Tracker. I wouldn't have thought so to get someone of. In assuming he has a good year like he did last year, he'd be at least a minimum of first two rounders. Those I mean, precedents have been set. But the other thing you need it's to either look- going to be a first, a good first rounder, and a good player, or, or two good first rounders, and we are nowhere near obtaining any of those. Yeah, so I, I did talk to you about this last. I uh, talk about this last year, and I said I'd heard this was done. But I think the thing that you also have to qualify is last year or the last couple of years, Melbourne's been a rattle and Collingwood's been in the finals, and Collingwood might have looked like an attractive destination before they unloaded three players and started sliding down the ladder. And Melbourne may get their shit together, and it's like, well, would you leave a club that's finally getting their shit together to go to a club that's losing their shit? I mean, the one, the, the one thing really of Collingwood, I've said this before, is it really feels like it's just in caretaker year. Caretaker presidents, caretaker coach... Everyone's just running on the spot until someone makes a fucking decision about where this club's going to go. And the sad thing is, if the presidents do come out of the existing board, the board that oversaw this mess, it's just going to be a perpetuation of the same old shit. It's the kind of way, though. I mean, you, 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 those that aren't, uh, the, that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. That should be our, um, instead of getting fire peak, we should have that in the, uh, on, the, on the emblem. AFLW. What do you feel about the game against North, the final? Is, is it good to get passionate about um, something oh, yeah. at a Collingwood jumper again? Um, I thought that was an absolutely ripping, stirring, come from behind wind. Wind? Wind. Um, that was that was a phenomenal effort from the girls. I was um, anxious, tense, um, all the things I didn't think I'd ever be watching that comp. Um, it's all the things that I used to be following. The, the men's stuff, um, how they can hook you in, how... I mean, you still get a little bit of that. I mean, I was on the edge of my seat on uh, um, Thursday night, but not in the same manner as I was on Saturday watching that. I guess the stakes are higher and there's there's still a potential for... Hey, well, um, let me just sort of um, interject here. Again, you know, I was watching it to function, but, like, watching that game and we lost, I was like, okay, well, this is what I expect now from this club or from the men's side because... Hmm. And I know I've said this before, and I've said this before, what they did last year to me really broke that side. And I think this side's in a real danger of just the whole thing unraveling because Pendles is 33, Sidey, Hal, um, 30, Roughhead's 30, you know, Maine and Greenwood will go at the end of this year. Once Pendles and, you know, Howe go, you suddenly, like, losing two gun plays and nothing's coming up. Mm. And the goey has been disappointing as a mid, He's really struggled to make the transition. So you're having these quality players go out and you don't really have anything coming in. And the players we have underneath are unknown quantities because we're not playing them. It's not like 06, 07, 08, 09 when Buckley and Burns and Lecuria and all that went. But you were playing Pendles and Daisy and you know, you're know getting games in the Wellingham and playing Swan and all that. And these guys were really coming up. So when, by the time Buckley retired at the end of 2007... 
Opening of 2008, Pendlebury was already our best midfielder. Swan was exciting. You know, Daisy was exciting. It was like, oh, this transition was not only seamless, but they actually improved the midfield. That's not going to happen now because we don't have those players in place. Uh, I know people are saying Nick Dacos and all that. It's like, geez, you're, you're going to break the kid. Walk in the Collingwood as an 18 year old. Okay, here, carry the midfield. Well, there's every chance it'd be broken in, oh. in some manner. Well, what would you do? I mean, he, he could actually decline to come to Collingwood. It's unlikely, though. But he could. I mean, he could. I mean, um, I've declined it this year. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that had certainly shaken up our plans. I think it'd have to be pretty much an ironclad guarantee. I think while his brother's there, he'll definitely come. But, you know, if his brother turns around and they re-sign Buckles and, Buck, and his brother says, as is being rumoured, that they're not happy that he's playing in a defensive capacity on the half-forward line rather than in the wing where he had a breakout year... He might just say, fuck it. You got rid of my friend Stevenson. You, you're re-signing this coach who's playing me in a way I don't want to be played. You know, I want to, you know, uh, evolve as a player. I'm not getting the opportunity, so I'm out of here too. I think in that scenario, re-signing a coach is the only thing that would possibly make that a possibility. You would think if it's if it's a given, that it'll, it'll be a given fairly soon um, that it'll be Bucks' last year. I think then that becomes irrelevant what the Dacos is think because it's going to change next year with the new coach that comes in. We don't know that for sure. Though. Unless it's Robert Harvey. How do, you, how do you feel? Or maybe they'll co-coach. We ever had two coaches coach a team in the history of the competition? I don't think so. I mean, we don't have much left that we can trailblaze anymore. Um, how do you feel about Bucks? Um, do I swear? Yeah. Well, um, I fucking swear. Oh, I mean, it's years. the same old thing. I love the... Loved him as a player. Um, no doubt he's a ripping bloke and all that sort of thing, but he's way past his use-by date. Do you like his press conferences? Oh, I don't watch them, so... All right, so back to the women's. I mean, it was a really exciting game. They were dominating. North came back, and it really looked like Collingwood had nothing and North were going to be too strong. And I was interviewing the North coach, uh, Crocker, and he was talking about, you know, hunting the ball and all that sort of shit. He was doing this to the screen. He put the finger up. All the cliches and all that. Last quarter, we came home really strong, and it was extremely tense, you know, watching it. And and when they would, when North were running over the top of them, I was like, oh, geez, don't lose this. You know, I, I can't handle two, you know, losses in the space of a week. I don't think you can handle that kind of rejection. No. And especially, you know, again, the stakes there for North, I'm oh, sorry, for Collingwood to beat North in the final. Because yeah, I think Adelaide and Brisbane are a little bit above them at the moment in terms of class and exposure to finals and all that sort of stuff. But, you know... For Collingwood to drop from top spot and then possibly lose the final and just drop straight out would have been heartbreaking. would have been, been um, yeah, devastating. So, well done to the no, AFLW team. They, they live to find another week. The dream is still alive. No doubt they'll have a spirited performance in the prelim. Uh, also, all right, so we're going to look at the matches coming up. So we're playing Brisbane in the prelim with the AFLW side. Thoughts? Um, look, Brisbane are going to go into that favourites, you would think. Um, but this is Collingwood. We win. We, yep. we, we never lose prelims. So I think we'll win that by 14 points. Well, no, we'll absolutely. We'll, what's the record uh, margin in an AFL W, w game? Well, whatever it is, we'll double it okay. in this. It'll be the most emphatic performance you'll ever see, and that's where it ends. And the men's team. It's the culture. The men's team are playing the GWS under 13s. Uh, yeah, if we don't win that by 10,000 points, give it away. Oh, okay, so very similar to the 2019 prelim where GWS fielded an under-14 side and they beat us. Um, someone pointed out to me earlier in the year, we're not going to lose the GWS now because Cameron's not there. Jeremy Cameron's not there and he's usually the one who dominates us. But for some reason, they just always stand up and find something extra when they play us. Is Keefe captain this week? I don't know, he probably kicks six. Yeah. So, so what's I mean, your... I mean, and who would you bring in this week? Um, yeah, look, I'd, I'd be dropping a few. I'd be dropping Hoskin Elliott. I'd be dropping Callum Brown simply for that miss. Um, why did he take that over Cox? Oh, that was Cox's free. What, what did he put in? I mean, because Cox, does he ever miss straight out in front? Well, he can only kick 30 metres, but fuck it straight. Yeah, but I, no, he can't, Callum Brown, because he's got such a great history of nailing those. Oh, uh, well, you know, I don't... This is an interesting thing of Callum Brown. I think it's also... Um, it's a symptom of what's wrong with the side at the moment. You look at Callum Brown in 18, 19, he took the game on a bit, you know, and he kicked a few really nice running goals where it was like, I could handle a hand, but no, I'm going to run, I'm going to dodge. 
It was a game against Sydney 19 over there. It was close. And I think we were about a, just under a goal up, but there was like a centre bounce. He roved it and he streamed from the centre. He ignored calls to pass it and he kicked it and he sealed it. But the moment he has a set shot, it's just like, no. Nah, you know. If it makes the distance, who knows where it's going. So yeah, look, that'd be definitely the three I'd drop and that'd be my opportunity to bring in, um, I don't give a fuck which of these 48 kids are in the wings. I think McRae's Just... definitely got to come in and try it on the wing. What about Rantel? He was our number one pick. Is he ever going to get a look in? What about Murphy? He's been on the list for 72 years now. He's concussed. <laughs> <laughs> you can play football with a Zimmer frame. Um, it, look, I would take anyone because their output is going to be equal to, at a minimum, 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 a minimum or at least they'll outperform the others at the moment. I think they're going to play McCreary. They selected him as a sub, which I just think it's ridiculous selecting any debutante as a sub. Oh, and then make a song or dance out of it. Come on. You know, um, but it's like... Okay. It counts as a game too, do you know that? Yeah, I do. It's ridiculous. Uh, but you do you at- remember your first game? It was good. I was in a tracksuit. And I ran around a white line. That was like Damien Munkers first game. He never got off the bench. Um, was he asleep? No, he was just... Matthews never put him on. But in terms of like, you know, being a, a debutant, you'd think, geez, come out, first bounce, acclimate to the pace of the game. If you brought on like the last 15 minutes where it's scrambly and desperate and all that, what do you expect to do to just sort of pick up the tempo immediately and have an impact? Surely... You either play from the beginning or you're not. But again, I mean, who else would you play? I mean, they've got no one else in the... No, that's it. There's nothing in the wings. That... There's Greenwood and that's about it, isn't there? In terms of um, I don't even know. season players. I don't even know why what his medical state is at the moment. Greenwood. Yeah. All right, so I'd be dropping Hoskin. I'd drop in Thomas. I'd be dropping the two Browns, not just one. I'd be dropping both of them. Um, I think they're likely prospects, but I think they're being run into the ground by... When they're not showing great form, they're being kept up there and it's not great for their development. They need to be just sent down and get it, you know, find a bit of touch and all that. Um, there are therefore practice matches. Everyone played awesomely, apparently. Oh, don't they always? They the, lost, though, I think. The Collingwood, so. Yeah, they lost. They got over on last quarter. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, the Collingwood social media team, digital man, that manager, he was quick to be on social media and I can't remember the players were, but it was like... Oh. Which supporter did they condemn this week? No, no, but they said like McGuinness and McRae and I can't remember the other one. Oh, a midfield for the future. It's like, well, yeah, okay. Your midfield for the future. you got to fucking play them. <laughs> which midfield though? Which, which competition though? Well, you might have been talking about the VFL midfield. I think it's the, the Mid- Melbourne's midfield. Yeah. So I'd be playing those. I'd be playing anyone, but I'd be dropping those for just... Also, simply because GWS has so many injuries, so this is the time to be debuting younger players because you'd think there's going to be a bit more of a like-for-like in terms of the matchups, you know? So that's what I'd be doing, but I mean, I I imagine they're just going to go in unchanged. No, no. Maybe Main omitted, Greenwood in, and uh, Rantel as the uh, interchange. I think it's likely that... Just pick any player at Let, Fuck it, let's say Maynard. Maynard will just be out. Maynard could be the interchange sub. That way we've got the golden uh, triangle. He's struggles at the moment. But that, just some player who... You, he could be the first injury sub to be injured on the sidelines. That'll happen at Collingwood. But there'll be some guy we don't expect to be out. It'll be like, oh, actually, he did a hammy or some shit. And it's like, okay, because that's Collingwood. What's your tip? Um, Collingwood by 74 points. Over GWS? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm tipping it's GWS like, by 14 points. Yeah? Yeah. Well, you know that one of us will be right. What if it's a draw? <laughs> yeah, well, neither of us will be right. Um, but seriously, watching the game last week, I don't know. I mean, I, I just expect a comedy of errors this week. Um, and you'll get it. That's one thing they won't disappoint on. It'll be like watching Justice League. Nah, I think they should do this comfortably. So, take it from Spook. It's all going to turn to shit. It's, it's money for jam. I'd, I'd load up everything you've what, got. What does that mean, money for jam? I don't, I don't get that. Well, it means you get money for jam. <laughs> but who wants jam? I don't want jam. Well, you Why want you give me money? money? Well, if you, don't want, want, if you don't want jam, you take the money. <laughs> but you're saying it's money for jam. Why are you giving me money if I'm not going to use on the jam? I don't know. I don't make these things up. I just say them. Um, subscribe, leave comments. Um, what else do we do? Yeah, the usual. You know what you're doing. You've been watching it long enough. All right. And we'll see you next week a little more promptly, probably. Yes, yes. Sorry for the delay. It's uh, Easter and all that sort of thing. I was off praying. Was it? No. 
I heard you just kept watching Justice League over and over. <laughs> I had to fire well, an arrow not... over to your place and just because, you know, they it's put it on news. The Snyder you... Cut does go for four days. Yeah. And all of the quality. <laughs> anyway, we'll see you next week. Later. Hurry, Vidachi. Worst for a weather. Yes. GWS by 28 points. Why did you say that name? <laughs> <laughs>